I use fiction to understand my entire life, including my depression. How that works for me is that I, from a young age, from investing so deeply in the Harry Potter series as I was growing up, I learned to really believe in the stories that I was reading. Hello, and thank you for joining our podcast, Hope to Recharge, a show that is designed to bring hope, inspiration, motivation, and some practical tips to those that are battling depression and anxiety, and to those that are supporting loved ones that are going through the journey in this difficult time of depression and anxiety. I'm here to tell you, you are not alone, and we will live beyond depression and anxiety. We will share our stories one story at a time in a world of mental health together is better. I'm your host, Matana. Thank you for tuning in. Hello and welcome to Hope to Recharge. Thank you for joining me here today. Today I have a guest from Scotland. She is so creative. I spoke to her for over an hour when we were thinking about doing this episode and I felt like I want to get on a plane, go to Scotland and just sit by her side and just deep dive into mental health, spirituality, finding hope. And she reached out to me. She's also a fellow podcaster. She listened to some episodes and she was telling me how she dealt with her journey in depression and how she found recovery and how she's still dealing with her ups and downs all through fiction and what she did in order to start her journey and her hobby and her business, what she does now. And it's a fascinating story. The reason why I was so excited to have her on, and I'm going to introduce her name in a minute, is because it just gave me this idea that everyone has their own journey and recovery and everyone has to find what works for them and what brings wellness for them. And she was so fascinating to me and I'm so delighted to have her on my show. So welcome, Zandra. Thank you to Hope to Recharge. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for making time across the ocean to talk to us about mental health and how you found wellness. Montana, I'm so excited to talk to you. We're finally, we're finally having this conversation. Yes. And I'll, I'll share a quick story about my name, that my name is Zandra, which is short for Alexandra, because as a kid, other kids would call me Alex and I'm just not an Alex. So mm-hmm. I chose to shorten it with the other side of mm. my name. So I like that. Yeah. Taking control of my story, starting with my name. How old were you when you changed it? I, in high school, I had a friend who told me, you know, everyone's just going to call you Alex. So you need to give them another option. And so I like came up with a list of options. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I came up with the idea, but I didn't start to implement it until university. In my first year at Oxford, I was joining the climbing club Mm -hmm. and I knew that in an intense sport like that, when I'm falling off a climbing wall and people need to say my name, right. they don't, they, they need a shorter version. So I was like, <laughs> this is, this is the new start. I'm going to, I'm going to introduce myself as Zandra here. Avoid the whole Alex thing. That's a very interesting. So it just shows how creative you are because you chose, because usually we're like set in stone what we got our name or what um, name that our parents call us or the nicknames or whatever comes up when we're young. And we don't think like, if we don't like it, let's change it. But it just shows how creative you are and you take control of what works and changing it and, and being okay with it, which is now a little bit more insight in who you are and how you take control of things that come up in your life, difficulties. Yeah. And I will say, if anyone wants to call me Alexandra still, I will absolutely accept that. It's just avoiding. You can call me Alexandra Matina if you want. It's just <laughs> avoiding avoiding the Alex pitfall that is is just inevitable. Right. So Zandra is a, a huge creator, like a creative mind. I could see her sitting in on the top of a mountain, just creating and being so okay with just being there on her own with her creative mind. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I do that. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> and I didn't know yeah. that. And I really didn't know that. I, I feel her energy is just creative. And 
I feel like it's a gift that people get that they are okay with being with their mind and they see the beauty of what they have and the gift that they have. And they're in the moment present in their creative mind. And it's really a gift. Well, thank you so much for <laughs> for seeing that because it's something that is very important to me is being present and something that I've worked on mm. a lot. Um, especially, especially recently, because growing up, I was always an overachiever. I was always trying to fit in doing more and accomplishing more. And I've learned that there is a balance to that that requires stillness and that there's so much power to be had in stillness. So that's something I'm really, I've really been working on. And um, so thank you for, for noticing that. Yeah. And your energy is so calming. And it's just a, also another lesson for our listeners and for myself that when we're in stillness, sometimes which we need it, we bring peace and calmness to us and the surrounding around us. Your energy is really radiant and very calming, very, very calming. So I need to maybe take some lessons from Zandra, how to be more present and calm with our mind. I wish you could see her calmness. Uh, well, I, I don't feel calm. I feel like I'm just, I'm bouncing with excitement here because I, I can't, I'm um, so excited for this conversation. So I'm okay. glad I, it's, I seem calm. Yeah. Okay. This is so kind of calm. yes, there's definitely a calm energy. So I like giving my listeners a background on who's, who's speaking to us and who's giving us some insight. So can you give us a few sentences or a few minutes of where you were born, what kind of background, how many, how, who are your parents, where did you go to school, what kind of personality you had growing up. Take us until, say, college. Cool. We're doing the biography. Yes. All right. So I was born in Charlottesville, Virginia, and my family moved around um, a few times as I was growing up because of my dad's work. He's a doctor and was moving between different practices. And something that is an important part of my story is that the first time that we moved um, that I can really remember because I was, I was so young in Charlottesville and then I went to kindergarten in Ohio. And when we were moving from Ohio, a friend of mine gave me the first Harry Potter book mm. as, a, as a moving away present. And so I blasted through the first three Harry Potter books, which were the only ones that were released at the time. And then when we got to Northern Virginia, where we were moving, um, this was the summer of 2000 and book four was coming out. So I had the first three books during that spring in a couple of months. And then when we got to the summer and got to the new neighborhood, I had the fourth book. And then it just so happened that every time my family moved, a new Harry Potter book would come out. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> And so when every time when I was in this new house, I got a new book as well. And I sort of got to follow the next chapter of the fictional friends that I had gotten to know at Hogwarts through these books. And it made that transition process of being a new kid in a new place that much more familiar because th there was this new book as well. Mm. How often did you move? So th there were a couple more books after that. Uh, so uh, <laughs> how many times did I move? Like seven or so times, I think. Wow. But it was not like, it was not big, crazy moves. It was Virginia to Ohio, back to Virginia in a different part of Virginia, and then to Boston for a year, back to Charlottesville, and then back to a different part of Boston. And it was still an adjustment, but it was sort of familiar as well. But you always needed new friends. Yeah. That's very hard. It was hard, but I think it was also just normal for me. That's what you knew. Yeah. And I, I had really good pen pals. I had really good long distance friends from, Beautiful. yeah, from going up and who I'm still friends with today. Right. 
And so it really, in a way, prepared me for what adulthood is like when you leave your familiar home, when you leave your familiar home that you make at university Mm -hmm. and having to make friends over and over, that was a really valuable skill. Absolutely. Do you have siblings? I have a younger sister who I podcast with. Really? Yeah. (laughs) That's so cool. Where does she live? Yeah, she lives in Chicago. Oh, so I guess you like the cold. She goes to Chicago. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Okay. I guess because you were in Boston so much. We're from Boston. Right, right. So you're used to the cold. That's something that's familiar to you. Where are your parents now? My parents are still in Boston. And still in Boston. They live downtown and I got to visit them and the dog a few weeks ago. Oh, nice. Very nice. And what was it like growing up in terms of your emotions? Were you very sensitive and um, emotional or depressed or, or aware of your emotions when you were growing up? I was always very aware of my experience. And I've always been a deep thinker. So I would really think about um, about my place in the world. Mm-hmm. In an essay I wrote recently called Youngest Cast Member Award, I wrote about how even from age five, I knew that five years old sounded really young when people asked me how old I was. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, so I, I was always aware of like, People are going to ask me how old I am, and this is how they perceive that. Wow. So you're a very deep analytic mind. Are you also a super intellectual mind? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Okay. Okay. So you're an A student, probably. High achiever, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Always top of the class. Was it very important for your parents for you to be a high achiever? It was instilled in me. um, That was just, that's how you do school. Like that's what I was taught is that it's, this is not a choice. You're, you do your homework and you do the best you can do. And, and yeah, it never felt like there was any other way. Mm Mm-hmm. What about your mother? What's your your father's a doctor and what about your mm-hmm. mother? My mom ran a home stationery business mm. from when I was born. The business was born with me. Oh wow. And somebody asked me um not too long ago, "Oh, so that's where you get your entrepreneurialism from your mom." And I want to say creative. <laughs> yeah, and my deep love of stationery for sure. Yeah. You're writing cuz like you're you're a big writer. Mm-hmm. and stationary and pen, pen piling. Most kids don't do that. They're, if they're here, we'll chat. Or like back in the day, there was not really phones like that, but or we'll yap on the phone, mm-hmm. but you took the pen and paper. Yeah. So she started the stationary business. Is she she started a stationary business at home alongside her full-time job of being a mom. Oh, beautiful. Was she supportive of your emotions? Was it a conversation? I don't know. I hadn't really thought of that. I don't think we really talked about emotions, but my parents were always supportive of what I was passionate about. Mm-hmm. And so I think um, I think maybe there was a, it was a step removed where when I went to, they took me to a community theater production of Peter Pan. And they would always, my parents would always take us to cultural events, which was very um, influential for me. And I pointed to the stage at intermission and said, how do I do that? Oh, wow. Six years old. And my mom made mountains move to get me into the audition for the next show. That's so beautiful. And so, uh, yeah, I guess she was really um, in tune with my emotions and in that way of of being able to see this is something that I'm really interested in and stepping into the role of mom to help me get my way there. That's so nice. That's really yeah, nice. I think so. Do you have any dark moments growing up before you graduated high school? Do you remember any episodes of depression? Yeah. So actually, when I was in high school, I got very overwhelmed I was taking twice as many classes as I was allowed to be taking and um, out of choice Mm -hmm. and was trying to find this understanding of like what I came into. I went to a private prep school, high school, what I came there hoping to do and then what it actually 
was for me. Mm -hmm. And I fortunately had a really amazing English teacher who not only taught me English and taught me writing in a way that I still lean on today, Mm -hmm. but who also pulled me aside one day and said, you don't seem like yourself. And Mm -hmm. yeah, and he shared with me that he experienced depression and still does and that maybe I have that and to consider that. And I had never considered that. But having a teacher that I looked up to share that with me in such a a safe way, like an understanding way, that was like, that was the first seed. Wow. That is like, well, that is courage for him and and Mm -hmm. true leadership. I think if I think leadership and courage, that's Mm -hmm. him. Is it a him? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's remarkable that he's willing to be vulnerable. Also like risk it because you could have said, what are you talking about? I don't know why you're there. Why are you looking at me like that and, and judge him? And he was willing to risk the reaction for your better good. Yeah. I hadn't even thought of it that way, but it makes me even more grateful. So what happened after that? Well, what happened then was that I, it sort of didn't get addressed directly because at the same time I was having irregular periods. And so Uh, like really irregular. And so I got blood drawn to see what was up with that. And it turned out that I had hypothyroidism. I had Graves disease, a thyroid condition. And so a a side effect of that is depression. Right. And so I thought, oh, okay, I'm not, I'm not a depressed person. I just am experiencing it because of this thing that I have. And I took medication and that disease went away um, and the depression went away or so I thought. And I was able to write that off as like, okay, that was a blip. Right. Was it the first time you felt that feeling? I don't know. I don't remember because um, it it got really bad Mm -hmm. in high school. But I think I'd probably experienced something like that before, and it just wasn't it wasn't big enough to to really need my full attention. Or notice it or or be aware really of what's going on. Right. At the time I didn't, growing up, I didn't know that there was a difference between having a bad day Mm. and having depression. Interesting. So you think that the thyroid medicine took the depression away? I don't know. And it it probably helped. Um, But in my mind, as I processed it in the moment, I was thinking, okay, well, that's gone now too. Oh, okay. Did you, f- and, you stop the medication? It's like just a period of time that you take it mm-hmm. and then it's fixed? Yeah. It's a very, um, it's a very straightforward thing where you take mm-hmm. medication for a certain amount of time, you get blood work done, and then you can see what the, the levels are. I don't know the medical terms for mm-hmm. it, but it's a pretty, um, it's pretty easy to assess. Like you have it now, you don't have it now. Okay. It's not a constant thing that you, you, you have to deal with. Right. It's, I don't have that anymore. Okay. So you stopped the medication and you thought Mm -hmm. that you were good. And then the depression came back. The depression came back a few years later or two years later in my second year of university. Mm -hmm. And I was terrified because I was thinking, I, I, first I got a a blood test and made sure that the The thyroid thyroid disease hadn't come back. And then I was like, well, if I don't have a thyroid disease, then, then what is this? this? (laughs) Right. Why is this here? Right. Yeah. Was it worse than the first time? Um, was it worse? It's hard to remember how something felt, but it was worse in the sense that I didn't have a very obvious explanation for it. Right. And it took a couple more years to get diagnosed properly. Mm. Where'd you go to university? I was at Oxford mm. in England. Wow. High achiever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, working hard away from home, right? Yeah, and and for me Oxford was Oxford was not in the category of wanting to be a high achiever, surprisingly. Mm-hmm. It was a fantasy that was more in line with the being raised on Harry Potter. Right. Where as a 16-year-old I was fortunate enough to go to a really great summer program in Oxford for a month right. and experience this magical city that inspired so many fantasy worlds, including Wonderland and Narnia and Middle Earth. And I didn't know that this place existed. I'd never been to Europe before. 
This is my first experience in England. And it was just, I was so enchanted right. by this place. And then to connect it back to all of those fictional worlds that I grew up with. And a lot of the Harry Potter movies were filmed in Oxford as well. And so I really, I felt like I was stepping into it. So you knew you're going to go there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was like, it, it wasn't even an option to stay in the States. Well, actually it was, it, it became that, but it was the same English teacher, Mr. Raymond, who saw that in me. And I was telling him about how much, how this experience that I had and how I fell in love with this place and how it was my dream to go to a university in the U.S. that had the best study abroad program in Oxford. Really? And he said, well, why don't you just go? Right. Why don't you go right there? And I had never let myself consider that and had to do a lot of convincing, um, first with my parents and then with my college counselor and the school didn't want me to go. Because, do you know why? Oh, yeah, because, um, well, for my parents, uh, they, they just didn't really get it. And when I when they saw how much I cared about it, then they were quickly on my side. Mm -hmm. But for the school, it's a prep school and they need to get kids into good universities. And a lot of that is done through the the connections that they have, the people that they know. And so the words I were told was, we don't know someone who can get you into Oxford. Really? <laughs> I was like, how about me? How about I get me, myself? Me, in? myself and I <laughs> represent myself. Yeah. Yeah. That that also takes guts to, to to move forward and say, I'm gonna represent myself. That means you believed in yourself and you believed in your dreams and, and you were willing to take a chance of rejection. I think it was that I believed so firmly in what I wanted. Mm. And I find in in all the personal development that I do, if you can only be certain of what you want, then it's just a matter of finding a way to get it. But I find more often what's challenging is we don't really, we can't really articulate what we want. Mm -hmm. And that's harder. Yeah. Like I want to say you're, you're, you're lucky that you knew what you want and you were, because a lot of people don't know even when they're mid forties, what they want, let alone graduating high school, where they want to go and what they want to be that, that, that you're very fortunate that you had that clarity and that drive. And that teacher who helped me see what I couldn't let myself want. And so I think about that all the time of it's something that I, I, I exercise in myself is writing down my wishes and writing down the silly things that I haven't even that have like not gone through the filter of my brain. Yeah. So my brain will often stop me and say like, oh, that's that's a silly idea before it even reaches my consciousness. And so I practice uh, teasing things out of of that subconscious self before logic can get in the way. I love that. We should all yeah. practice that because we suppress, because of the fear, we suppress so much of our dreams and we mm -hmm. don't even let them, act, as you say, come into our brain, conscious brain. Mm -hmm. So let's practice dreaming and bringing them, even if it's a crazy dream, practice dreaming. Because if we don't, the things that we really want won't get done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so easy to busy ourselves with things that we could want. Right. But right. that distracts us from the, the heavy lifting that is dreaming. Yeah. <laughs> so you're in London, you're experiencing really hard depression. What do you do? Yeah. So in at Oxford, which is a, a, a little ways outside of London, it's yeah, okay. um, a couple of hours, but I would, I would go to London at, at the weekend sometime, which right. is really restorative. And I, this, the depression came and went over my last two years. And then it got really bad towards the end of my final year. And at, at Oxford, you don't really get graded for things. You you don't get homework assignments that add up over time. Most of my degree was based on final exams that happened at the end of my third year. And so um, I, I was trying to tell my tutor, I was trying to tell um, those around me, I, I really don't feel well. I don't feel like myself. I, I don't feel motivated to do my work. And everyone was saying like, oh, that's normal. You're, you have your exams. Mm. And... I, so I took my exams and I, the feeling didn't go away. Did so, you do well? Uh, I scraped by. I did, um, I, there, I, I did well enough. Okay. Yeah. Um, I could have done better mm -hmm. if, uh, <laughs> if I weren't battling this, but right. 
also at the end of my degree, I was starting to feel that same questioning that I had during high school of, well, I get what they want me to do and the in, the institution wants me to do. And I'm not sure that aligns with my goals anymore. And what I really learned from Oxford was how to write essays. Mm-hmm. And that's what I do now. Mm-hmm. I I still apply the writing process that I perfected as a student. And then what they're testing you on for your final exams doesn't really line up with what you've been learning mm-hmm. all along for the degree. And so it's complicated. Yeah. So how did you deal with going after you got your exams, your depression is continuing? What happened then? After I finished my exams and the depression didn't go away, I finally worked up the courage to go to the university counseling service and say, ask right. for help. Mm-hmm. And this is a hard story for me to tell because I had such an unfortunate experience where the counselor didn't get it and said, this doesn't make any sense that you feel this way. You don't have exams anymore. Really? <laughs> yeah. And I said, well, I, I know a little bit about depression. And I wonder if that's similar to something that I'm experiencing. And she said, no, 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 you don't have depression. It's Are you serious? In your head. Yeah. What? Yeah. And I realized later that she wasn't qualified to make that diagnosis. Yeah. And it was probably, I don't know, (gasps) but that was really hard to recover from and made it, made me feel worse, frankly, because now I had depression and guilt. (laughs) Right. Right. For daring to, uh, to claim that I had something as right. bad as depression when like, I guess I don't have it. Oh, so what did you do? Did, were you convinced that you didn't have it or you said, okay, she has no idea what she's talking about? Oh, I, I was something. so deep in how I felt that I was like, okay, I guess I don't have it. I guess there's just something wrong with me. Describe what a day in your depression life looked like. Mm, it's It's hard to, and I know that I keep saying this, but it's hard to remember because I just feel so blank. Mm -hmm. And for me, when it comes back, what it feels like for me is like, it doesn't even feel like sadness necessarily, but it it feels like this sort of whatever. Yeah. Numbness? Maybe. A lack of joy to life, a lack of interest to, to be involved. Yeah. And as a creative mind, you you find joy in stuff and to not have that and not to tap into that is like painful. Mm -hmm. And it it was confusing. Yeah. So what did you do? It took a long time to make progress after that. So I just, I didn't do anything uh, with, in the, in the quest to, to get well. I, Mm -hmm. I was just like, okay, I'll live with this for a while. And I moved back home to my parents in Boston. And um, nearly a year went by and I just kept feeling worse and worse. And I kept canceling on things and we were going out the door and going to see a movie that I was excited about. And at the last minute I said, I don't want to go anymore. Mm -hmm. It was that kind of thing. And then it got so bad that I, I, started to open up to my mom and tell her how I felt and how I, I didn't feel like being alive. Wow. And that was really, really hard for her to hear. And mm-hmm. I'm sorry that she had to hear that. Right. And she didn't really know what to do. And so she took me to the emergency room at the hospital and we waited for a long time. And eventually I got to see a psychiatrist who told me after speaking with this psychiatrist, she told me, I don't think you're depressed. I think you're severely depressed. Wow. Did that feel amazing to be <laughs> yes it did it was like thank you for oh saying that yeah, i can breathe now i can yeah breathe. you get Someone it gets it <laughs> I, I i have hope that i'll find something to help me now that you get it because living in that you don't have not giving your permission to feel what you have is almost worse than the actual feeling yeah wow and yeah, what did thank you, you for understanding that. Yeah. Oh my God. Ah. Totally. Totally. And that's why I always say like, find the people that will understand what you're going through because that's half of the good feeling that you're going to get, even though you might stay in it for a very long time. 
but that understanding and that support and that we get you, you are entitled to feel this way and, and you're not weird or, or evil or bad. That is such a rewarding feeling from with feeling all that pain and shame and, and struggle. I love the way that you, you phrased that. And it, it makes me so grateful to be on this show and that this show exists as well, Matana, because my goodness, if I had had access to something like this through all of the confusion, I would have felt this would have like right. <laughs> moved me forward so far just from knowing that there were other people who have experienced this too or have experienced this through someone else. Since I have opened up about my depression to people, every single person that I've confided in has either said, I have that too, or my parent, brother, or brother, sister, or best yeah. friend, somebody. Right, spouse, right. And oh my goodness, I was living by myself with this. Right for so long. And as soon as I started to talk about it, it got so much better. Right. Right. And it's part of the healing, the fact that we could talk about it and share, mm -hmm. find others and a, a belonging. Was your mother okay with the fact that you got the diagnosis and like, was she supportive? Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, anything that would help <laughs> at that point, because I was so helpless. Mm-hmm. And um, I think she was as relieved as I was to have, I mean, it was a hard day, mm -hmm. but she was relieved as I was to have a, have some sort of structure to understanding what I was experiencing because mm -hmm. none of us knew. Right. So I'm assuming you went on medication. I started out going on medication. Yes. And this was also the summer that I was moving here to Scotland to do my master's degree. And so that was a decision as well of like, well, I'm in the visa process for this. Should I stay home and get treated here? Should I go? And the psychiatrist and I decided and my parents decided, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. This is something that um, will lift me up. Yeah. So like could stick to that plan and right. Right. Um, that'll be good. So I ended up, I was on medication for about a year, I think, and I don't think it ever did much mm. for me. I didn't really feel different on medication, but so I, I don't take it anymore. I haven't taken it for a long time, but mm -hmm. I tried it. Right. Yeah. Did you try different different medications? Were you in touch with a psychiatrist, different, different doses, different cocktails? I, I think I just tried Prozac and different doses of it and then um, carried on with that treatment here in the mm -hmm. UK. But there's what I was told when I got here by the GP is that there's more of a culture of prescription in the US and more of a, and that's, that's less the belief here. Mm -hmm. And so they were sort of hesitant, but said, well, if this is what your doctor back home said, then we'll, we'll try it. I was, I was scared to take medication mm -hmm. as well. Right. But it's like, I'm committed to getting well now. Yeah. So take me down that journey and the listeners of how you found your relief because you really, like the truth is, you, you said that you still struggle with your depression, right? You still I have, do. Yeah, it still comes. Times. What was that? You still have times that you feel depressed or you are depressed, but I you still found, have times. but you have, you have a system in place of how to deal with it. And I think that's such a lesson that it's not about always getting rid of it. It's finding the tools to deal with it and rise above and basically go through the, the depression period until it lifts up and and you found the system. So your system is relieving your depression through fiction. That is part of it. Yeah. So I use fiction to understand my entire life, including my depression. And how that, how that works for me is that I, from a young age, from investing so deeply in the Harry Potter series as I was growing up, I learned to really believe in the stories that I was reading and to really care about the characters and to treat these worlds as if they were real. Mm. And I realized that not everybody does that. Right. That came as a surprise to me that I feel this so deeply. Mm -hmm. And so I started to play with it and started to integrate it into my personal development. 
Mm-hmm. When I learn a concept that feels, it starts out as abstract. When I'm learning something about myself or I notice something in my experience, what helps me really solidify it is to relate it back to the stories that I'm familiar with in fiction. Mm-hmm. And I do this as a person, and I also do this in my writing. Mm-hmm. So, for example, I wrote an essay this summer called So What Happened, Mm -hmm. which is about a recent bout of depression that I had. And it's about how people would ask me really nicely and kindly. People would ask me what happened Mm -hmm. when they see me crying and so upset. And the answer is nothing happened. It just is. It just, this is how I, how I feel right now. And I know that now. I know that that, um, is how depression works. Mm-hmm. And it's it took a while to embody that. But I've also learned that there is something to something to learn from that time. I would like to take this opportunity to pause for a second and give a big thank you to our sponsor, betterhelp.com. Have you been thinking of getting therapy for a while, but you live in a place that doesn't have therapists that meets your need? Or are they too expensive for what you can afford and you really want to get help and therapy? Or do you travel a lot and you can't access the therapist when you travel? Or do you come home from work and you're too it's too late to go to an office for therapy? Well, betterhelp.com is an online platform for therapy. You can access thousands of therapists and choose from the therapist that meets your need. Go to betterhelp.com forward slash hope to recharge. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com forward slash hope to recharge to receive your 10% off on your first month. Take charge of your wellness. Go try them out. They really try hard to match you up with the specific therapist that will meet your need. Don't wait to get help. Go now, betterhelp.com forward slash hope to recharge. You can access them from your phone, your tablet, your computer. You can be in your bed and you can receive your therapy you need. Don't wait longer. When this depression came up, I was able to recognize it right away because of the time that's gone by, because of the therapy and the work that I've done. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I know what this is. And I was more frustrated at it than anything. So it's like, why are you here? Why won't you go away? Why can't I just get on with my life? Mm -hmm. And um, how I explain that to people and how I understand that for myself is there's this concept in the Harry Potter series of a a scary creature called the Dementors, Mm -hmm. which are these shadowy figures. And I believe J.K. Rowling has said that they were inspired by her depression or it's Mm -hmm. been speculated. But what happens is they make everything go dark physically and they drain the happiness from you. That's what these creatures do, literally. Mm -hmm. And some of the students are affected by them more than others. So Harry has had this traumatic past. And so he is affected more deeply by the Dementors than others. And I I found that such an astute way of describing depression as well. Like we all know what it kind of feels like, but some people feel it more than others. And when Harry feels this for the first time, he doesn't know what this creature is. And he doesn't know why he's suddenly feeling this way. Mm -hmm. But then he learns how to... He puts systems in place, as you say. And then when they come back a few years later, they appear and he goes, oh, I know exactly what that is. Mm. And he's able to do what he has to do to get through it. Interesting. So what do you do to get through it? I'm learning to accept it, to let it hang out with me for a while mm-hmm. and to and to trust that there's something to learn from my feelings as you as you pointed out, I'm quite an intellectual person. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always motivated by what there is to learn. And the lesson this most recent time was that I need to be receptive to that. Mm -hmm. This is not something that I want to get rid of or that I need to fix or that I need to trace my steps and say, well, this is what I did wrong that led me to be punished in this way. I'm learning that depression has something to tell me when it shows up. Right. And that If I just stopped trying to scramble my way out and started to listen to it, Mm -hmm. started to listen to my own experience, to what I'm feeling, to how my body is feeling, I have a lot to learn from that. To be present in the depression versus to fight it. Yeah, absolutely. 
And what do you do as, as a tool with fiction to help be present? On a daily basis, what I like to practice, and this is sort of like what we were saying about practicing wishing and practicing dreaming big, is I practice letting myself get fully excited about whatever is catching my eye at the moment. So if it's a TV show or a book that is a page turner for me, I've dropped the, the word guilt from guilty pleasure. Mm -hmm. and just let myself enjoy the story that I'm captured by and trust that I am reading it for a reason and that there are th there's something important for me there. I love that. So yeah. you're basically giving yourself not only not being guilty, you're rewarding yourself for being in the pre present moment. Yeah. Like you're seeing it as like an extreme challenge and like, this is awesome that I get to be here versus, okay, how fast can I finish this? Mm -hmm. I have other things to do. Let's hurry up. You embrace it and you see it as a reward. Yeah. And it's like we were saying, it's so difficult to identify something that you you truly want. Mm -hmm. It's so difficult to identify that big goal. And yet in the present, when we're attracted to something, like I want to watch the next episode of this TV show, I can't wait. We feel that excitement start to bubble up. Why stop ourselves? So what do we do with it? You enjoy it. Embrace it. Yeah. So if I have a couple of hours in the evening and I want to just watch the next two episodes of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, <laughs> I let myself give that my full attention. And I, I don't feel badly about watching a couple of episodes of a show in a row. Right. And I try to enjoy the experience in the present as much as I can by like propping up my laptop. We don't have a TV. So propping up my laptop on a pillow farther away so that I can't open up another tab and multitask or mm -hmm. open up something to feel like I'm making progress on my to-do list. I make sure that I'm all comfortable and I just, I truly just watch it. I think that's a lesson that everybody should learn, not only people that are battling depression to be present because we're so busy running, running, doing, multitasking, and our to-do list doesn't end and our day is shorter than our dreams. And and then we're like, oh, I, I shouldn't watch this other episode. I shouldn't waste the time. It's such a waste of time. Really be productive. But you're saying if we're not present, there's no point in being productive. We need to live the now and be excited about what excites us without the guilt. Absolutely. I, I love the, I also love alliteration that happens to be my superpower. And you said, oh, you said a bunch of words that start with P that I, I agreed with everything. It was being present. <laughs> present, uh, yeah. <laughs> being present. There's, there's no point in being productive if you can't be present. You said something like that. Oh, nice. Share nice. That. <laughs> That's nice. And yeah. you also shared with me last time we spoke that you have this group, um, an online group that you have like a, an assignment that people have to dream about something or write something that they're fantasizing about or dreaming or something like uh, about something like that. What am I, uh, uh, something so it's, about it's, it, it, <laughs> creating the dream, right? Like inviting yourself to dream more. Yes. So I've captured that magic that I experienced the first time I stepped into Oxford, the first time I opened the book of the first Harry Potter book. And I've created a program called Everyday Wonderland. Oh, every, that's what it was. Everyday Wonderland, right. Everyday Wonderland, because it's about finding magic where you already are. I need everybody to listen to this because about like, as soon as I spoke to Zandra, I, this was the part that excited me the most. And if we can incorporate this and really do it, I feel like it can shift everybody's life. So, so listen to her now, <laughs> really listen and take <laughs> it in. I appreciate that. Stop whatever you're doing and just listen because I think it's so important. Well, we're both radiating with excitement right now because because <laughs> this is it. So, in everyday Wonderland, we have not assignments but weekly calls to adventure, and each of these, I send a digital postcard every week to your email. And each one ends in a call to adventure that takes one minute of your time maximum. And these are little shifts that will help you connect with the present moment and also connect with that fantasy version of your life. 
Mm -hmm. to bring in all of the wonder that inspires you from the different fictional worlds that you inhabit, fantasy worlds that you inhabit in your head, little shifts that will help you bring them into your daily life because daily life is how we live our lives. That's that's all we have is one day at a time. And so and it's my, not fiction. It's reality. Right? Right. Yeah. And and for me and for and for my readers who care so much about fiction, fiction is real mm. to us. And there's I think there's this block of like, oh, but I shouldn't I shouldn't care so much. It's not real. Well, it's part of our experience. And so let's embrace that and let's find ways to play with that and really bring that to life and let that let that expand into, into what it can be for you. So give an example of how you do this with something that comes along your way. Okay. I... I'll start with I'll start with the one that I I told you before because it's a really good one. Is um every month we have a theme and for our month of sparkle I set the call to adventure to turn on a song, a 2-minute song while you're brushing your teeth because I looked it up you're it's recommended that you brush your teeth for 2, two minutes. 2 minutes, right? <laughs> and how boring is that to just stand there and count Minutes, most people don't seconds. do it for two minutes because it's too long and it's too boring, right? Yeah. So, so play a song that that uh, that lasts two minutes and and have a little dance party while you're while you're brushing your teeth. And then I like to say that when when you add music to your daily life, it's like adding in a soundtrack. Mm -hmm. It's making your life cinematic. So true. So true and it just lifts everything up it just it just changed the vibration and invites more it's just different the energy mm -hmm. cha ch changes so you're saying take a, a a regular moment in a life and turn up the volume and make it special Ooh, yeah. make, it st make it make it stand out make it something that made an, an impression and a shift in your energy versus just brushing your teeth that doesn't makes you clean but it doesn't shift your energy that's my favorite place to start are those things that we have to do every day that mm -hmm. are not things that inspire us. Those are the places that I like to look at and say, how can this be a mini adventure? Mm -hmm. Right. So you have to and, do it anyway. You might as well enjoy it. Right. And I think for the minds that are very cognitive are like probably rolling their eyes and saying, this is not for me. I don't have time for this, but the truth is they're missing out on life. They're missing out on being and experiencing. And instead they could do two for one. Not only are you brushing your teeth, you're elevating your spirit. You're creating a sparkle. You're creating an energy. So why not? You're yeah. missing out. You're living on the table what you could take with you. And you know, it is a trope in in the kind of books I like to read of like, there are the good people and the evil people, and there are also the boring people. <laughs> right. And so uh, I'm thinking of the Dursleys and the Wormwoods and Matilda and the least attractive characters are the ones who are not engaging with their world. Right. Because because of whatever reason, it might be fear of, of looking silly. Hmm. But if we let ourselves have fun with the things that bring us joy then happiness can happiness doesn't have to be something that we have to work so hard for. Right. Do you find that your depression really shifts when you do these things? When you're in a deep depression, can you do this? Like, do you let yourself do it? Do you work hard to get to do this, to turn on the music? Or is it something that it's like medication? I'm going to take it so I can feel better. So I'm going to turn the music on because this is what's going to make me feel better. I Something that I created out of a, a really bad a um, couple of months with depression is an ebook called A Spell for Feeling Well, mm -hmm. which is inspired by the Harry Potter series. And I have this list of what to do when I feel right. depressed. Right. Um, or just if even if it's not as bad as depression, if I'm just not feeling motivated or inspired. And it starts with taking care of my basic needs mm -hmm. because in the Harry Potter series, we always start back at the Dursleys mm. before we go to the castle. We go back to the the boring suburb, but it and it does the job. Right. And so in that category, I take a shower, I hydrate, mm -hmm. I um make sure that I'm fed 
right? All of that kind of stuff. And then the next stage beyond that is when I start to cast spells. Mm -hmm. And those spells can be in the form of music Mm -hmm. by playing a song, Mm -hmm. getting out a book and reading one page of it and seeing where that takes me. Mm -hmm. Because I find that the hardest thing when I'm feeling unwell is to start to take care of myself. Right. Right. The shift. So we know, we know therapy will help. We know running will help. I was just talking about this this morning. We know exercise was was in our mind. We know that if we start running five minutes into it, we'll feel better. But how do we get Mm -hmm. our running shoes on? How do we take the first bite when we have no appetite? How do we Mm -hmm. nourish ourselves mentally when we are depleted? And I guess that is the exercise that you're training yourself and your, your group is finding systems and putting them into place and finding that sparkle. It could be music is not your thing. So find something else, find something else that if it's reading a page, if it's writing, if it, if it's imagining, if it's watching an episode, whatever it is, a walk in the park, chatting with something, watching an inspirational video, find that thing that shifts you into that sparkle. And what I learned in in creating this is that I don't have to want to feel better to go through these steps. Say I used to again. think that... Say that again. I don't I think have this to, is hard for me to understand. I don't have to want to feel better. Really? I used to think, yeah, I used to think the first step is like shifting my mind and thinking, okay, now I want to get better. Hmm. But actually, that's really hard for me. So how does someone get better if they don't want to get better? Well, I can I can only speak for myself and how I how it feels for me. But I have this list and I just go down the list and do the things because I'm like, oh, I don't really care. I don't care about getting better. I don't care about doing I hear what you're saying. You're saying when I'm not motivated to get yeah. any better, you have a sit because you know that that's what you're going to feel, but you really do want to get better. So you made this list before you get there that will move you through the actions in order to get better. I think the end goal is the wish, but when you're in it, you don't have to have it. Right. So because it's this knowledge because, right. that if I do... If I get to the bottom of this list, I will feel a little better. Mm -hmm. But the reality that I've come to accept in myself is that when I'm feeling really low, I'm not even going, what that feels like to me is a lack of motivation to do anything, including getting better. Exactly. I've done the prep work. Exactly. (laughs) So I, I call it, give yourself permission to not being okay. Yeah. Just give yourself permission and say, yeah, today is a sucky day. Today I'm going to mm-hmm. feel like crap. And today I'm not going to feel motivated and love yourself for that and be okay with that, that you're not feeling motivated and you don't want to get out of bed and you don't want to take a shower and you don't want to clean the dishes in the sink and you don't want to make your bed and that's okay. And love yourself for that and don't feel ashamed by it and don't feel hard on yourself and don't feel guilty. And then what you do, you have a system in place from beforehand to help you guide you through that time because you know what will help you actually get through it and what will take you, will move the needle a little bit. Yes. I think what you're reminding me of is that acceptance is a really important stage for me, accepting that I feel this way. It's not trying to change how I feel, but it's validating what I'm experiencing right now and how how deeply I experience it and saying, you don't have to change this. And I say, once you do take the shower, celebrate your win and give yourself Mm. the biggest pat on the back that you actually did it because it was hard. It was hard and you really didn't want to. So I say people, people, like I say, it's like running a marathon. People are get ready for it. They run, they run there and they get the biggest pat on the back. But we run our own marathon in our mind mentally in order to embrace ourselves to take these steps and the courage that it takes to take the shower, to get dressed, to get out of bed, to whatever we need to do is sometimes harder than running a marathon. And and people that don't experience it don't understand it, but people that went through it get it. They just get it. Yes, it's hard. And celebrate the wins. Even if it's a small win and that the world would say, okay, big deal. You took a shower. No, big deal. You took a shower. You put on the music when you didn't want to hear music. 
you press play, you sat down. Like those are the celebrations. Match now you're giving me an idea for a call to adventure on the spot, which is a really <laughs> silly one. Yeah. But I was going through my old things at my parents' house and I found this box of like of race medals from like, fun runs that I did as a kid. Oh. And I was like, well, what do, what do I even do with this? And your metaphor of dealing with depression as a marathon made me think of like, what if next time I'm feeling this way, I take a shower and then I put on a, a fun run medal? <laughs> yes. Yes. And because... I'm probably like, is the last thing I want to do is like, I don't want to put on that medal, but like, well, you're, it's going on. You know why? Because we don't feel like winners, but yeah. we need to remember that we are winners because doing that one step is winning. It's really winning. It's, it's, it's a medal. And if we gave it to ourselves, sometimes we wait for society to give it to us and society won't give it to mm -hmm. us. So let's give it to us. Let's give ourselves the the love, the acceptance, the medals that we deserve because we're the fighters and we know what it took to get through whatever we're getting through. So let's give ourselves a medal, whatever the medal is. And I always say, if you did something, celebrate it. If, if you love chocolate, have a, have chocolate. If you want a coffee, have a coffee. If you want, if there's something that makes you happy and, and you feel like you deserve like a little bit of a yay, like celebration, do it really celebrate it because it's a celebration. And you know, I know you're um you're not as much of a Harry Potter nerd as I am, but I, I've never read them or watched it. <laughs> <laughs> so you there's no way you could have known this, but one of the remedies for dealing with dementors, the creature I was telling you about earlier, is chocolate. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's amazing that you brought that up. <laughs> That's funny. Well, chocolate is an antidepressant in a way, like mm -hmm. it, it really is. And I love chocolate and cho chocolate and coffee for me is like a win-win. A, a but you know what? When I was really depressed, I couldn't have coffee because of the feeling that it gave me. But I love the smell. So I mm -hmm. used to go and open a new jar of coffee to just smell it, to remind myself of the joy of drinking coffee. But if I took one sip of coffee, it would spin me into a panic attack and anxiety. So I couldn't have it. It was the biggest hurdle for me was to not have those cup of coffee that treated me to joy. And so I found a way by, by smelling. I smelling was, yeah, I just found a way <laughs> to to say, and I remember the first cup of coffee I took after I think a year and a half and it was a decaf and it was only small and it was only two sips, but I remember that excitement. I'm, I think I'm well enough that I can tackle this cup, this whatever, how much I drank. I don't remember, but I remember it wasn't a big amount because I was nervous, but I said, okay, I could do this. I can have a cup of coffee again. It's decaf. And, and I overcame it. And this was so exciting to me. Now, people that don't go through the struggles don't understand what we're talking about, but I I see you're smiling and you totally get it. It's and 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 when you when you're talking about Wonderland, that's what it is. What is your sip of coffee? What is that enjoyment that you can bring into your life and celebrate? I also love coffee, so that's also why I'm smiling. <laughs> but that reminds me of um, our month of cozy, which was now a year ago, and one of the members of our community um, took a call to adventure. And the call to adventure was really simple. It was find a way in one minute, with one minute of your time, add something that will make your day cozier. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking like, wrap yourself up in a blanket right. like I'm doing right. as I'm <laughs> podcasting. I'm wrapped up in tartan like a yeah. stereotype of a Scottish resident. Yeah. And Nicole came up with... Um, making a cup of hot cocoa in a takeaway cup at home mm. and taking that with her on her morning errands. Totally. And like standing in line, sipping her homemade yes. hot cocoa. Yes. Yes. I was just um, recording somebody, um, that uh, someone that I can't wait to release this episode. And he, his name is Chris and he has a podcast called Coffee Over Suicide. Oh, do you know him? No, but I love the name. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to check that out now. Yeah. So Coffee Over Suicide, and he talks about how you can decide in the morning, you can either kill yourself or you could just have a cup of coffee. And I was telling him that my biggest joy is to take a disposable cup every single morning. And we have this, my, my husband's in printed giveaways. So we have thousands of mugs in the house with every saying, every color, every shape. And I give them away. I just 
get rid of them because we have too many mugs in our house. But I want my disposable cup every single morning. And no one is allowed to have a disposable cup unless they're on the way somewhere. Like if you're in the house, you're not allowed to have a disposable cup besides mommy. It's mommy's treat. (laughs) And it's my joy to have my disposable cup every single morning. I told them that sometimes I feel like having a blue mug or a bigger mug. So I take the ceramic or the glass, but usually 99% of the time, it's a disposable cup of of a styrofoam cup and it's my joy. And I actually smile every single time I take that styrofoam cup. And that's my cozy. That's really my cozy. Yeah, you're cozy. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So we have to create it. We really have to create it. Tell me a little bit about your husband. You you mentioned that you're married. Yes. My my husband, Steve, built the podcast studio that I'm recording in right and now. And it's really cool. And I was saying that she has a really awesome husband that created this really awesome podcast studio. And um, he must love her a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> and he, he also he also loves uh, home DIY recently. He's mm-hmm. been um, really enjoying that. And um, we both are really passionate about nature and connecting to the earth and going for, we met rock climbing. So we love being outdoors Mm -hmm. and working with our hands. So he likes building things and I like writing by hand. I always Mm -hmm. start my writing by hand. Mm -hmm. Um, That's a a great part of what we connect over. Mm -hmm. Does he understand your depression? He has learned about it with me, alongside me, as um, I have been with him for a long time now. And so he's been there uh, through all of this confusion and Mm -hmm. has been a huge part of encouraging me to to prioritize the importance of of finding a support system. Mm -hmm. And of course, he's part of that support system, but also, um, also recognizing that like I need professional help sometimes. Right. And what does he do as someone that never dealt with mental health? What does he do to not step in your way, but still be as a support? Because it's a fine line. Mm. Yeah, it's he listens really well. And we talk about this and I'm grateful that we get to to talk in so much detail about Um, sort of when I'm in, when I'm experiencing depression, but also the sort of the, the recap of like, okay, so what was that? Let's figure that out. Let's figure out, um, what is, how can I best help you? He asks, Mm -hmm. and we go over that. And what I've learned is that I don't always have the answer to tell him (sighs) and that that's, um, it's a lot, I think for, for someone experiencing depression with people, even surrounded with people, surrounded by people who care. And mm-hmm. want to do something. It's so hard to tell them, here's specifically what you can do to help me. And so um, navigating that communication of like, sometimes I'm not going to know mm-hmm. what to tell you, but I appreciate your presence. Exactly. But I love the fact that he asks you and he doesn't just implement what he thinks is going to help, which a lot of times is the biggest mistake that people around us think, okay, this is what I'm going to do to help you. And that, and you're like, that, that doesn't help at all. It's actually making it worse. So um, giving respect to the one that's suffering and say, how can I help you? How can I help you? What can I do to make you feel better? And sometimes it's it's easier to have a conversation when you're not in the deep episode and you can reflect and say, okay, really what I need? Because at, in the moment, it's hard to even communicate sometimes. So when you're out of it and say, okay, this is really, really what helps me during my deep depression. If you can come and just hang out with me, don't talk much. If I'm disconnecting, let me disconnect, rub my back, um, give me some support with a cup of coffee. Think of me, check in on me. Um, forgive me if I'm not nice. Uh, forgive me if I'm neglecting you. All these things have the conversation before because sometimes it's really hard to have it during. And your husband sounds really, really remarkable. So you're really lucky. You're really lucky. Thank you. Thank you for for pointing out the specifics as well because I am really grateful and it's easy to it's it's really nice to hear it repeated back and say, Oh yeah, that is that is really nice. That's, That's really, really nice. nice. Yes. Um, and it's funny because he knows about my spell for feeling well too. And so sometimes he'll be like, do you need to take a shower? <laughs> do you need a cup of water? Right. Like, I know you're just reciting my spell back right. to me. But... Right, right. 
Yeah. Do you, do, do you tell him how grateful you are? I'm going to right after this. Yes, do that. <laughs> Write him a nice yeah, note definitely. or tell him or surprise him with something because I just spoke about this on, t I think it's airing tomorrow on my gratitude uh, episode about being grateful for our support system mm. and how we take it for granted sometimes, not because we're taking for granted, just we're too busy surviving and mm. and take a moment to think the people around you, if it's your therapist, your friend, your mother, your spouse, your colleagues, take a moment to whoever's supporting you through the journey and thank them because it gives them courage to continue. Mm -hmm. And it really gives them validation that what they're doing is is good because sometimes they're not sure. Like, am I doing the right thing? Am I saying the right thing? Am I showing up all right? Like, I want them to feel better, but I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do. So giving them that gratitude and the validation really gives them energy to continue and trying because it's a hard road to be in as a partner and as a loving partner. I love that. <laughs> yes to that. Yeah. To wrap up, where can people find you? First of all, what's the name of your podcast with your sister? I have a couple of podcasts, actually. Oh, my um, God. Yeah. The the one with my sister is called What's Your Favorite Part? And we recap TV and film that we're excited about. And um, at the moment, that's when there's something that we are both really interested in. We, okay. we do a pop-up episode. Okay. And then I run a weekly show called The Art Life, which is about the process of being an artist in the present day. Mm -hmm. Because it can be, we can get fixated on art as a job or mm -hmm. as an end product. And so right. my co-host Grace Gordon and I talk about art as part of our our whole lives. Mm -hmm. Not do you something ever, we do sometimes. Do you ever interview? We would love to start interviewing. We're a new podcast. It's only been a couple of months now. And so once we get um, once we get settled in our routine, I cannot wait to bring on interview guests. Because I would love to introduce you to my mentor, Samantha Bennett. She is all about creative artists and she wrote two books. One is Start Right Where You Are and Get It Done. Samantha Bennett, she's the she's the founder of the creative artist company. Fantastic. And, and she's all about the artists, the artists, creatives how to keep motivated, how to get it done, how to get your dreams true, write down your dreams one step at a time, 15 minutes a day. She's into, She has like this whole system in place. And she was my first mentor when it came to entrepreneurship. So she she's definitely, and she has like a world of creators, a creative minds in her Rolodex. So you should definitely have her on your show. And she also deals with depression and anxiety, mental health. And she's a big advocate. And we spoke about this, I think. Uh, you should listen to the episode with her. I had her on. I think it's one of my first episodes, Samantha Bennett. And she talks about how she, I, she thinks that creatives suffer more than the usual with mental health because it's just, it's a hard process of the mind to being a creative. You're reminding me actually, um, I'd forgotten about this, but you were asking about how my husband, Steve, deals with my depression, understands my depression. And I remember years ago, he explained to me how he understands it, where he said, there's this episode, and it was through fiction. Mm -hmm. So there's an episode in Doctor Who about... I'm, by the way, my daughter only watches Doctor Who. I don't even know what oh it is. Goodness. I've never watched it. I don't know. But I'm like... Javi, what are you doing? I'm watching Doctor Who. I said, what's Doctor? She's like, you won't get it. <laughs> oh, well, maybe she'll get this. But I haven't actually seen this episode. Um, he's the Whovian in our family. But there's an episode about Vincent Van Gogh. And I can't, I can't even explain the context of it. But there's something about how he says that artists feel things more deeply. Yes. Yes. connected to the world in a more of an intense way and that they are, that can be really challenging, yeah. but you can also create out of it. Absolutely. And I, and I think that that's what happens. They go into this deep analytic thought because they're creating with their mind and that can lead to, to depression, to anxiety, to bipolar. It does. I, I really think there's a link. There's definitely mm. a link. It's the curse and the blessing together, maybe. <laughs> Mm. part of it maybe so this you is something i'm yeah. i'm writing about right now actually um is i'm i'm writing an essay about balancing that challenge mm -hmm. of of when art hurts 
yes. how to create when when it hurts. And so um, that's fascinating. by the time this episode comes out, then that will probably be published as well. Okay. So where can people find your essays and your writings? Everything is based in my digital castle of heroinetraining.com. Mm -hmm. And that's where I publish my writing every week. I have, there's, I mean, I've been writing there for years. And so mm -hmm. what I recommend doing is I created a start page mm -hmm. at heroinetraining.com slash start. And that is an introduction to the first three essays that will, I, I will read them to you. It's an audio book. And um, that's where I recommend people get started if they um, would like to experience my words. And then I, I publish there every week and my essays are available to read for free. Nice. And Wonderland? And Everyday Wonderland is, well, you'll find that there as well. Mm -hmm. And everything is based on my Patreon page as well. So um, Everyday Wonderland is through that, read by Zandra, where I read my audiobook versions of my essays. That's all in one place there. And so if you go to heroinetraining.com slash start, then that will, that's the first, uh, the first place on the, uh, the magical treasure map that will lead you down all of these different avenues of the different things that I've been publishing through the years. And beautiful, beautiful um, essays, really beautiful essays that sometimes can bring you to tears, really. So it's, I think part of the, the emotional part is that I always am, I'm amazed by how God cr creates such complex minds that can do, be so talented, Thank really you. so talented. Yeah, really Thank so talented. You. I got so much from this episode. One is finding what will work your way to work through the depression, not always, always get rid of it. What, what, what is your path in finding whatever it is to make you feel better for now, getting through it and everyday wonderland, creating our wonderland every day, the sparkle, whatever it is to create it. And another big takeaway was from your husband that he asks you, how can I be of help? How can I support you? So if anybody's there um, dealing with a loved one that is suffering, don't try to fix it. Ask them mm -hmm. what they need. Ask them. And sometimes they don't have an answer. Like Zondra said, sometimes she doesn't have the answers, but sometimes she does. So wait for the answers to come. Yeah. Keep asking. Yeah. Keep asking. And it's a hard question to answer. So and that's what I've learned to say is, I don't know right now, but I keep asking. Right. And find support. That's also that when you were alone, it was so painful and so hard. And the, when the moment someone recognized what you were having, you were able to share and feel okay sharing and finding support and as as much as you can. So we learned a lot, a lot, a lot in this episode. Thank you so much for sharing. Is there anything else you want to share before we say goodbye? Oh my goodness. Well, I... I feel like I've learned so much too. And I'm so grateful for, for you taking me on this journey back through my own life. And mm -hmm. it's, it's so wonderful to get to, to share my story with you and to hear your responses to it and to hear things that I hear things that I appreciate just amplified. Turning up the volume on life. Turning up the volume. That's my takeaway. Yeah, turning up, the volume. turning up the volume. Sandra, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your insights, for showing up, for being, for smiling when it's hard, for being yes. brave, <laughs> for being brave and, and for taking God's gift that he gave you and really sharing it with the world because it's not fair to get a gift and not share it. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. I so, love that reframe. Yeah. So <laughs> guys, thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of this fiction journey. Find what works for you. If it's fiction, if it's support, whatever it is, find what it is because you have the answers and go deep into your, into your subconscious and the answers are there. They're definitely there. You just have to tune in and it's not all always about finding the wellness. It's being present in whatever it is and feeling it in order to get out of it. Thank you for joining us here today. Hope to see you next time. And I hope to hear from you either in our Facebook page, Hope to Recharge, or emails that you're sending us constantly, how you 
find wellness? What do you do? What is your fiction? Sandra's is fiction. What is your fiction in your journey? Bye till next time. Thank you for joining us and taking the time to listen. I really appreciate it. Please hit the subscribe button so you can hear further episodes. If you are listening to us on iTunes, please leave feedback and ratings below. Let us know if there's any topic that you would like to hear from us in the future. Bye till next time.